Well, you do. We have a mutual acquaintance in Chief Superintendent Hadley. Oh, perhaps he's been delayed. Uh, no, 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 he's here. But the landlord just called him away to the telephone. Yeah, do sit down. Yeah, let me move that newspaper. Ah, lunchtime edition. The Mad Hatter strikes again by our special correspondent, Philip Driscoll. <laughs> You'd think they'd find something better for the front page. Well, I've been out of town for a few weeks, so I've rather lost touch. But Hadley's put me in the picture. I gather Mr. Driscoll is your nephew. Unfortunately, yes. He started writing about some lunatic who goes on snatching hats from the heads of law-abiding citizens. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to have become the latest sensation. Yes. A policeman's helmet found on a costermonger's donkey. A judge's wig on a lamppost. A series of practical jokes, obviously. I'm afraid I don't see the funny side of it. Last Saturday, this maniac stole my top hat as I was on my way to a meeting in the city. And this morning, as I was getting into my car, he stole my grey Homburg as well. And such inclement weather, too. You might get a nasty head cold. But I understand you also suffered a more serious loss. Ah, the stolen manuscript. Well, that's unique. Irreplaceable. An unpublished story by Edgar Allan Poe in the great man's own handwriting. Sorry to have kept you waiting. I see you've introduced yourselves. So, William, let me get you a drink. Uh, a whiskey, perhaps? No, no, nothing, thank you. Are you sure? I, uh, I don't know quite how to tell you this, but... Uh... What's wrong? Sir William, you must prepare yourself for a shock. It's about your nephew. Oh, I knew it. It's those damn practical jokes. What began as a joke is no longer a laughing matter. The boy is dead. We have reason to believe that he was murdered. Oh, no. Surely not. His body has been found at the Tower of London, at the foot of the steps by the traitor's gate. And on his head, someone had placed your stolen top hat. We present Donald Sindon as Dr. Gideon Fell in The Mad Hatter Mystery by John Dixon Carr. Notes made by me, Gideon Fell, on October the 10th, 1936, concerning the murder at the Tower of London. The news of the tragedy was bad enough, but that finishing touch made it particularly hideous. Hadley drove us to the Tower, not as fast as he would have liked, for a thick mist was rolling in off the river and visibility was poor. I encouraged Sir William to talk. I thought it might help. Well, perhaps you could tell me about the missing manuscript. An unpublished tale by Edgar Allan Poe must be quite a rarity. May I ask how you acquired it? I was in Philadelphia, and I wanted to visit the house where Poe had lived as a young man. When I got there, I discovered the building was being demolished, but the workmen let me in to look round, and as they pulled out an old cupboard, they found a flimsy packet of papers behind it. One glance at the handwriting was enough. The men weren't interested, so I said I'd like to have it as a souvenir, and I, um, I gave them ten dollars. Well, they were quite happy with that. You know, what did you do with your acquisition? I had it authenticated by Craig Roberts, one of the world's leading authorities on Poe. I told him I'd no intention of selling it, and brought it back to London, and kept it in my dressing room. Why, well, I thought it'd be perfectly safe. But it wasn't. Uh, when did it disappear? Sometime between Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning. There was no sign of anybody breaking in. Mm. Now, did any members of your family know about the manuscript? Well, yes, but naturally I couldn't possibly suspect any of them. Oh, naturally. No. But all the same, just to clear them of any possible suspicion. At present, the household consists of my daughter Sheila, my brother Lester, and Laura, his wife. Philip had his own flat in Tavistock Court. It's a modern block off Tavistock Square. Though he usually joined us for Sunday lunch. Well, that's all. Apart from an American guest who was staying with us, Mr. Julius Arbor. Oh. He's a collector like myself, with a special interest in Poe First Edition. What did you tell Mr. Arbor about the manuscript? Well, no, I, um, I intended to show it to him, but um, 
Somehow the opportunity never presented itself. And there was no one else in the household who might have shared your interest in Poe. Oh, certainly not. When I discovered the manuscript had gone, at first I admit I was a little suspicious of my manservant, Henry Marsh. Oh, why was that? Well, he's only been with me a few months. When I questioned him, he became nervous and flustered, but I put that down to his natural stupidity. He'd never even heard of Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> Damn fool! Stepping off the pavement without looking and in a fog like this? Sure. It was fairly murky this morning when I came out of the house. Which is why I didn't get a proper look at the brute who took my Homburg. Oh, the Homburg is... Now, how did that happen exactly? Well, I thought it was a sneak thief trying to break into my car. But when I went up to him, he just grabbed my hat and ran off before I could stop him. Oh, well, never mind that. I keep thinking about Philip. I was fond of the boy, but perhaps I was too strict with him. I kept him on a tight allowance. He had no idea of the value of money. I paid the rent for his flat, and I made a point of going round there regularly, on the first Tuesday of every month, just to keep an eye on the place and make sure he wasn't getting into mischief. Well, now I, I shan't have to do that anymore. Here we are, Tower Hill, and the gate's open. We passed through the gateway and were stopped by the guards on duty. When we got out of the car, a human warder was waiting for us. Superintendent Hadley? Uh, yes. Who's in charge here? Uh, the deputy governor, General Mason. He discovered the body. Mason? Thank God. He's a friend of mine. If I might have your name, sir. Uh, this is Sir William Batten and my colleague, Dr. Fell. Very good, sir. Come this way, please, General. He led us through the precincts of the tower, over a stone bridge across the moat. Beneath an archway, opposite the stone steps leading down to Traitor's Gate, General Mason met us. Good God, Batten, but how on earth... I I was going to ring you and break the news as soon as I'd spoken to the superintendent, but... It... Never mind. This is Superintendent Hadley, yeah. Dr. Gideon Fell, yeah, uh, General Mason. So, where's the boy? I, I want to see him. This is where I found him. We couldn't disturb the body until the police arrived. Just tell me... What killed him? It appears to be the bolt of a crossbow. That's about four inches sticking out of his chest. Straight through the heart. Instant death. No pain, whatever. Were there many people here today? No, not many. That's on account of the weather. If you'd just come down the steps with me, Superintendent, I've got a flashlight. Perhaps you'd wait here, gentlemen. If you look over the rail, I think you'll be able to see for yourselves. Philip Driscoll lay at the bottom of the steps as if he had rolled down them. In the torchlight, we saw the gleam of steel projecting from his chest. The top hat on his head was much too large, coming down almost to his eyes and flattening his ears. It was a grotesque spectacle, and obviously distressing for Sir William. So General Mason escorted the old man into the building before rejoining us under the archway. Sorry to keep you waiting. No doubt you will need me to answer some questions. Yes, sir. When exactly did Driscoll arrive, do we know? Somewhere about 20 past one, I gather. I wasn't here. Dalry, my secretary, picked me up from the middle of town in my car, and we got back here at 2.30. We, we came in this way, along Water Lane. Dalry let me out at the gate of the bloody tower, and then he drove back to put the car away. I was going into my own quarters when I remembered something that I had to do. So I came back here... And as I passed these steps, I glanced down. I couldn't see very clearly, but I, I could tell something was wrong. So I went down and found him. Minutes later, Dowry returned from the garage and I called him. I told him who it was. Well, he and Driscoll were old friends. In fact, Dowry is unofficially engaged to Sheila Batten, Sir William's daughter. You will hear about that. I told him to fetch the doctor, but of course it was useless. And when the doctor examined the body? He said that Driscoll had been dead at least three quarters of an hour, possibly longer. <laughs> Forgive me, but you appear to have identified the young man immediately. How was that? Well, as, as I say, he and Dowry were close friends. Driscoll was always popping in and out. We all knew him. I see. <laughs> One more question. About the crossbow boat... They're not exactly common or garden weapons. Did it come from the collection here? I can't tell you, but the armory will know. 
It was pretty bleak under that archway, and so the general suggested that we should go into the warder's hall at the Bywood Tower to join Sir William. We sat and warmed ourselves by the log fire for some time until his secretary came and found us. Superintendent Hadley? Yes. The general asked me to tell you that... Oh, Sir William, I'm so sorry. I I don't know what to say. Yeah, that's all right, Robert. Thank you. Now, what did I... Oh, yes. The armoury could see at a glance the crossbow bolt isn't a genuine weapon. It's a modern copy. But they'll be able to tell us more once the police surgeon has... Well, you know. Yes, yes, of course. Oh, and another thing. There weren't many visitors here because of the fog. After they'd been questioned and their details had been taken, most of them were sent home. But there are still two people the General thought you might want to see. One is Mrs Lester Batten. What the devil is my sister-in-law doing here? Does she know about Philip? Yes, I told her. She was very upset. And I told her you'd arrived, Sir William. And the other visitor? An American gentleman, Mr Julius Arbour. Now that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Dullery, I understand you and Mr. Driscoll were close friends. Ever since our school days. In a way, he seemed to rely on me. He often turned to me when he had problems. Uh, what sort of problems? Financial, mostly. Nothing serious. But he sometimes ran up bills he couldn't pay. Oh, he did, did he? Sorry, I shouldn't have said. But nothing serious. Nothing that might be considered a motive for murder. Oh, no, nothing like that. I mean, only this morning he... Uh, yes. What brought him here this morning? He rang up very early. I live in, you see. I've got a room upstairs. But this morning I was a bit late coming down, and when I walked into the office, Parker, one of the warders, was on the phone. Hang on, sir. He's here now. Just come in this minute. Mr Driscoll for you. Hello, Phil. You're bright and early. Oh. What's wrong? Well, if you think I can help... Can't you tell me what it's about? Oh, all right, then. Yes, I'll be here at lunchtime. Drop in about one o'clock and we'll see if we can sort it out, whatever it is. See you later. Uh, will you be here at lunchtime, sir? Wasn't there something about the General's car? Oh, yes, damn it. The electric horn isn't working. I've got to take it along to Hoban and get it fixed. But I can leave that till after lunch. Did you say Hoban? I mean, there must be a garage nearer than that, surely? Yes, but this particular garage is run by an ex-soldier from the General's old regiment. Anyway, I didn't think much more about it, until about a quarter to one, when I was waiting for Phil to arrive. And then... I'm oh, sorry to disturb you, Mr Dunry, but... Oh, I thought you were on the phone. I was. I only just rang off. Ah, uh, well, there's a call for you on the other line. Mr Driscoll wants to speak to you. I thought he was coming here at one o'clock. Seems like there's been a change of plan. Anyway, he's holding on. Oh, well, I'd better see what he wants. And what did he want? He sounded rather strange. He said he couldn't come to the tower, so I'd got to go to the flat and meet him there. He said it was a matter of life and death. Didn't he give you any sort of explanation? No. I said, I thought you were doing so well following up the Mad Hatter story. And he said, I followed it too far and now it's got me. What did you do? Well, I had to take the car to Hoban anyway, so I drove there and left it at the garage, saying I'd pick it up later. It's only a short walk to the flat. I rang the bell a couple of times, and then I walked in. Wait, he left the door open? No, I've got a spare key. You see, the gates here close at ten sharp every night. Nobody goes in or out after that. So if I'm out for the evening, Phil lets me doss down in his sitting room. I mean, he used to. Anyway, I went in, but he wasn't there, so I sat down and waited. Now we come to the strange part. I still can't explain this. Oh, go on. According to Parker, about ten minutes after I left, Phil turned up and asked for me. When he told him I'd gone to the flat, Parker said he went white as a sheet. He said he'd rung first thing and arranged to meet me at one, but he never changed the appointment. He didn't make the second phone call. But you spoke to him yourself. Well, yes. At least I thought so. Oh, Parker, the very man. Uh, beg pardon, sir. But um, I was telling him about the second phone call. You thought it was Mr Driscoll too, didn't you? To the best of my knowledge, it was. But since he turned up later, I suppose it can't have been. And you told him about the second phone call? Yes. He used some very strong language. Very put out he was. 
When I suggested he should go back to the flat, he said, no, when he finds no one there, he'll come back. I'll stay here and wait for him. But he was a bundle of nerves. How do you mean? Well, he couldn't sit still. Presently, he said, I'm going for a walk. And out he went. And by then, it was nearly half past one, so I thought I'd better phone Mr Dalry. I had the number of the flat, so I rang and told him what had happened, and he said he'd come back right away. And I looked out of the window. I wanted to tell Mr Driscoll, but he was walking towards the traitor's gate. He went under the archway, and that's when this other person reached out and touched his arm. What other person? Male or female? I couldn't tell you. They were in the shadows. But someone reached out, and he turned towards whoever it was. Then they sort of disappeared in the fog. I see. Well, thank you. You've been very helpful. Before you go, I had the impression that you originally came in to tell us something. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. The General's compliments. He asked if you're ready to see Mrs. Batten and Mr. Arbour. Well, Mrs. Batten, certainly. I think we'll keep Mr. Arbour waiting a little longer. Excellent. That won't do him any harm. Very well, sir. I'll fetch the lady right away. The police surgeon sent us the murder weapon. Along the side of the bolt, a single word was engraved, and the word, horribly apt, was carcass. We were still examining it when General Mason brought in Laura Batten. Hatley tried to cover it up, but it was too late. Superintendent, this is Mrs. Batten. Oh, goodness. How on earth does that get here? You mean you recognise it? Well, of course. It belongs to me. My husband and I bought it when we were on a walking holiday in France. They sell them as souvenirs. Well, you can see it says Carcassonne on the... Oh, somebody's been tampering with it. Yes, the pointed end has been filed down. Was it always as sharp as this? Oh, my God. Is that what... Is that how he... My dear, we must try to deal with this calmly and sensibly. This is Chief Superintendent Hadley and his colleague, Dr Gideon yes. Fell. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? Uh, uh, please, sit down, Mrs Batten. Oh, thank you. Now, let me get one thing clear, Sir William. If this souvenir was kept in your house, I presume you've seen it before. Not that I remember. Oh, wait, Laura, you went to France while I was in America. I suppose that must be... That's why I... I... I, I can't... Are you all right? Yes, it's... It's just a... Suddenly I feel rather tired. Uh, so much has happened. Of course. I think it would be better if you went home and tried to get some rest. Let me take you up to my quarters. I'll give you a brandy. I have a fascinating collection of letters on my desk concerning Walter Raleigh's imprisonment. I'm sure they'll interest you. As the two men left, I saw a look of horror on Laura Batten's face, as if she'd suddenly thought of something that terrified her. But she pulled herself together as she turned to face Hadley. So, it's true, then. Even when Rob told me he was dead, I couldn't believe it. Rob? Rob Dowry. It's been a terrible shock for him, for all of us. But I don't understand why I had to be questioned, as if... Well, you don't imagine I had anything to do with Phil's death, do you? I have to question anyone who might have been in the vicinity at the time of his death. And when... When did it happen, exactly? Well, according to the surgeon's report, sometime between 1.30 and 1.45. Can you tell us where you were, then? Oh, I'd been wandering around. I was probably admiring the crown jewels. I often come here. Not so much for the history as the exercise. Walking is so good for the figure. You should try it, Doctor. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll bear it in mind. And did you happen to see Mr Driscoll during your walk? Of course not. I didn't even know he was here. I see. Well, I don't think we need to detain you any longer. I'm sure you're anxious to get home. And as Mr Arbour is waiting... Yes, I saw him. What's he doing here? I wish William had never invited him to the house. He's a ghastly creature and a terrible liar. You can't believe a word he says. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, what did you make of her? She is an old hand at evading questions. Very frightened. I saw her face just before the general left. Something he said terrified her. I don't know why. 
to um, I missed that. Look, I've got to go and check the statements from the other visitors. I think I'll leave you to deal with the devious Mr. Arbor. You can pretend to be me. What? what? No, just now, he's it. probably a complete waste of time, but you might as well put him through the ringer. No, I'll do nothing of the sort. I refuse to participate in such... Listen just... here, I don't know what's going on, but I've been put to a whole lot of inconvenience this afternoon. I'm sorry, Mr. Arbor. The chief superintendent will see you now. Uh, carry on, chief. Apparently, you're in charge of this investigation. Yes, apparently, I am. Yes. Uh, please, um, sit down. Oh, thanks. Of course, I'll be happy to assist if I can. What do you want to ask me? Well, uh, how about, have you read any good Edgar Allan Poe manuscripts lately? What? I thought you were here to investigate some sort of murder. Yes, also a missing document. Perhaps you might find that more interesting. If you're referring to the theft of a certain manuscript taken from Sir William Batten... Ah, so you know about that. I thought you might. And he thinks I'm the guilty party. Believe me, I'm not insulted. But I thought it wiser to move out of Sir William's house this morning. I've made arrangements to stay with an acquaintance in Golders Green. I'm sure you'll understand. You know, so what I don't understand is how you knew that manuscript existed. Sir William told me he never mentioned it to you. Oh, that is true, but he's like a child. He couldn't resist dropping hints. So I took the precaution of checking with an old friend back home, Craig, Craig Roberts, who told me he had seen it, and it was undoubtedly authentic. So I decided to buy it. But Sir William had no intention of selling it. Oh, he had no right to it. Okay, he paid a few dollars to some workman, but it wasn't theirs to sell. In law, it belonged to the owner of the derelict property, so I called that guy and offered him $10,000, and he agreed. The whole transaction was perfectly legal. Not if it involved murder. Murder? But there's no connection. I mean, I, I know a man's been killed, but that's got nothing to do with the manuscript. You mean you don't know who the man was? He was Sir William Batten's nephew, Philip Driscoll. Oh, my God. I had no idea. I expect you met him at Sir William's house. Oh, yes, I, I did briefly. He, he came to lunch the Sunday before last. Oh, that's just... That's just terrible. Terrible, indeed. Well, perhaps you could explain what brought you here to the tower at lunchtime today. Well, I, I, I'd heard they had some interesting letters about Walter Rowley, and I was hoping to see them, but they weren't on show. Well, I was just on my way out when I almost ran into a young couple in the fog, a man and a woman. I, I thought his voice was vaguely familiar. You mean that was Driscoll? Can you remember what he said? Just let me think. He said that they were in a real mess, and something about his uncle getting to hear of it. Then he, he suddenly said, Oh, hell, I forgot. There was something he had to do. He said he'd be as quick as he could, and he told her to go take a look at the crown jewels and that he'd catch up with her later. Then he dashed off, and she walked past me. I couldn't see her face because she had her head down, but I remember the coat she was wearing. Do you know, I saw it again just now, coming through that door. Laura Batten was wearing it. And what time would this have been? Uh, about a quarter after one. Thank you. Yeah, one last question, if I may. Your valuable manuscript has vanished, but you don't seem interested in finding it. Since you claim it's your property, why haven't you reported it to the police? Oh, I, I didn't want to trouble the police, but I've not been idle, I promise you. Let's just say I've been following up certain leads which are... Forgive me, not open to you. Good day. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Don't mention it. Well, how did it go, Chief Superintendent? <laughs> Don't give me any more witnesses like Mr. Arbor. But it knocked him for six when he found out who the murder victim was. He didn't know? Not until I told him. I'm sure he didn't steal that manuscript. He's still desperate to get his paws on it. But he might have hired someone else to steal it for him. 
Of course, Driscoll. We know he was often strapped for cash, so if Arbor was prepared to pay him enough... No, 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 no. You can accuse anyone else. But I beg you, do not for one moment accuse Driscoll. Why not? I don't imagine he made much as a freelance reporter. He practically lived on his uncle's charity. And I dare say he figures handsomely in the old boy's will. Do you really believe he'd have risked all that to steal his uncle's prized possession? Now, look here. I refuse to discuss this wretched business any more. It's nearly six. I need a drink. But I'll leave you with a couple of hints. What sort of hints? One, Driscoll was last seen alive at the traitor's gate at 1.15. He rushed off to another part of the building and returned to the same spot, where he died between 1.30 and 1.45. So where did he go during those missing minutes? And my other hint, since... Driscoll's head was more or less the same size as his uncle's. Why was Sir William's hat far too big for him? Think on these things, my dear chap. See you later. Thank you very much. Ah, I thought I might find you here. What's happened? Not another fatality, I trust? No. But a couple of interesting developments. I sent a man round to Tavistock Court, and he arrived just in time to see someone, possibly a woman, leaving Driscoll's flat. The front door had been forced open, probably with a chisel. Someone had turned the flat over, searching for heaven knows what. He put in a report, but it doesn't tell us much, though he mentions one rather curious detail. Two cheap plaster figures on the mantelpiece, labelled Philip II... And Mary Tudor. Ah, I know two things about Queen Mary. One, she was passionately in love with Philip II of Spain. And two, she's generally known as Bloody Mary. So if Philip represents Philip Driscoll, who the devil is Mary? Did you notice the initials on Laura Batten's handbag? L.M.B. I wonder what the M stood for. Oh, well. Now, what was the other interesting development? When our friend Arba left the tower, he picked up a cab. But his behaviour was so strange that after the cabby dropped him at Golders Green, he went straight on to Scotland Yard. He said Arba was in a terrible state, shaking with fear and mumbling something about a voice. That voice. His voice. He's still here. He's coming after me. Beg pardon, sir? It was his voice, you see. Now tell me something. Do you carry a revolver? <laughs> Why would I want a thing like that? We're not safe. It was his voice. How are we being followed? No, sir. The road here is perfectly clear. Oh, good. Good. But he can still find us. Hey, listen. That address I gave you in Golders Green, I want you to drop me off before that a couple of streets away to be on the safe side. So the voice will never know. The cabby obeyed orders, but he remembered the original address. I had the house checked. It's rented by an American couple. I've sent a man there to stay out of sight and keep... Welcome to Thinking Out Louder. Please like, comment and subscribe. Thanks. I think you should tell your man to make himself as conspicuous as possible. Eh? Well, what's the point of that? If Arbor sees he's being watched, he'll be so terrified he might even tell us what he knows. But before that, if I may, I'd rather like to take a look at Philip Driscoll's flat. That's the one, the last door on the left. You see that crack of light? It's still ajar. My chap must have left it switched on. Not necessarily. What the... Come on! We found a man, tall and heavily built, standing before the fireplace. On the mantelpiece was a gaudy statuette, a woman in mock Tudor dress, and the grate was littered with fragments of plaster, the remains of a companion piece. As the man looked up, we saw his face in the mirror. Good evening, Mr. Lester Batten. Yes. Who the hell are you? My name is Hadley. I'm from Scotland Yard. 
This is Dr. Gideon Fell. We had to question your wife earlier in connection with the death of your nephew. Yes, the young swine's dead. She told me when I got home. I'd intended to call on you later this evening. I'm afraid we have to ask you some questions, too. Yeah, perhaps you could uh, carry on without me. There are a couple of things I'm looking for. In another room, I expect. As a journalist, Mr. Driscoll must have had a desk and a typewriter somewhere. Uh, will you excuse me? Mr. Batten, I'm not interested in your marital problems, except insofar as they concern our investigations. We know that your nephew met Mrs. Batten today at the Tower, and I have to ask, is it possible that they were having an affair? <laughs> That's a damned lie! How dare you insinuate... I'm not insinuating, I'm asking a question. Or had Philip already broken off the affair? It's none of your business. When they met today, he was a very worried man. Perhaps he was afraid Sir William might find out what was going on. Had he told your wife the affair was over? Is that why she followed him to the tower? In a desperate attempt to make him change his mind? And if that failed, we also know he was stabbed with a weapon that belonged to your wife. Can you imagine what a clever lawyer could make of that? I'm not staying here to listen to any more of this. Get out of my way! Leaving already, Mr. Batten? I suppose you've heard all that. Oh, yes. Though I have to say, I don't agree with your theory. Laura Batten might have killed Driscoll, but you would never have stuck that top hat on his head. No, of course not, I realise that. But I was hoping that by casting suspicion on his wife, I might persuade Mr. Batten to come clean and tell us what he'd been up to. Uh, I congratulate you. Very convincing performance. Pity it didn't work. What have you got there? A tool bag. I found it in the kitchen. So that's what you were looking for. The chisel that was used to force open the front door. Oh, hardly. You don't suppose somebody came in, found the chisel and went out again in order to break the door down, do you? <laughs> no, I was looking for this. Hang oh. on, this could be news of Mr. Arbor. Hadley? No, I am not the constable on duty. He left some time ago. I happen to be Chief Superintendent Hadley. Who is this? Sheila. Oh, Sheila Batten. Sir William's daughter. Uh, I beg your pardon? Oh, I see. Well, I suppose you could, but when do you want to come and... Tonight? But she's coming here tonight. Her father's asked her to pick up some of Philip's belongings. Is there anyone there who could come with you? It's getting late and... Uh, sorry? Uh-oh. She says Dowry's with her. He'll drive her over. Well, let me speak to her. Ah. Uh, hello, Miss Batten. Uh, Gideon fell here. Uh, fell. Uh, please remind Mr. Dowry that he has a ten o'clock curfew at the tower. Perhaps you should bring someone else to see you home. How about Sir William's band servant? Uh, what's his name? Um, um, Marsh. Of course, yes. Uh, well, please bring him as well. I'd like to meet him. And uh, I look forward to meeting you. Goodbye. Well, what's brought this on? You're very keen on meeting people all of a sudden. I've always enjoyed meeting people. I love the human race. Hadn't you noticed? No. I'm sorry. May I, um... <clears throat> may I come in? Ah, Mr. Batten. I've... I've changed my mind. Uh, I want to make a confession. A confession? You mean you... Little, wait, wait. Let him finish. It's true. I, I did suspect that my wife and Philip were involved with one another. I've been employing a private detective to follow my wife and report in the meetings. So I have a witness who was shadowing Laura today at the tower, someone who can swear that when she left Philip, he was alive and well. I'm not proud of my part in this, but I had to tell you. <laughs> Where do we go from here? I think you should go home. You've done things you're ashamed of, like the rest of us, but tonight you only smashed one plaster figure, then you could have smashed two. You spoke up on your wife's behalf when you might have disowned her. So, uh, go home, Mr. Batten. Well, I'm still very fond of her, you see. I Thank you, gentlemen. Good night. And since there was no reason to doubt an independent witness, we removed Laura Batten from our list of suspects. 
but that still left us with many unanswered questions. Where did Driscoll go when he left her? Where did Julius Arbour fit in? And whose was the voice that terrified him out of his wits? I'll tell you something we overlooked. Uh, may I tell you what you're thinking at this moment? You're saying to yourself, murderer, big man, very disturbed emotionally, man with access to crossbow bolt, man not even questioned about his whereabouts at the time of the murder. Lester Batten, uh, that's exactly what a... Hello? Oh, the lock on the front door seems to be broken, so I let myself in. Rob, Mr. Dalry, is parking the car. I'm Sheila, Superintendent Hadley. Uh, that's me, and this is Dr. Fell. How do you oh, how do? Did you... <laughs> Oh, what's happened to Mary Tudor? That was one of the things I wanted to take back with me. You've seen these figures before, then? Oh, yes. I was there when they got them at the fair on Hampstead Heath. When who got them? Phil and Laura and Uncle Lester. We all had to go on the rifle range. Uncle Lester's a very good shot. Oh, really? When he asked Laura to choose a prize, she picked out those figures. Uncle got quite cross and said he wouldn't have such rubbish in the house. So Phil said he'd like them. That's why I wanted them, to remind me of him. I'd even phoned Rob to ask him to persuade Phil to give them to me, but... Uh, when did you telephone, Mr Dowry? Well, it was ages ago. I can't remember exactly, because I, I talk to Rob every morning. Either I ring him or he rings me. Phil used to tease me about it. Sometimes he'd ring me up pretending to be Rob and, and say silly things. So, did you speak to Mr Dowry this morning? Of course. Did he tell you Philip was going to meet him at the tower at lunchtime? Yes, he said Phil had got himself into some sort of mess again. Was this at breakfast time by any chance, with the rest of the family sitting there listening? Yes. When I rang off, Uncle Lester said he wanted to see Phil today as well. I don't know why. That's all it was. Nothing interesting. Nothing interesting? Sorry to keep you waiting. I was just parking the car. And What's wrong? I was telling them about this morning... Uncle said he wanted to speak to Phil today, so if Phil was going to be at the tower at one, he'd go round to the flat during the morning. And he asked Daddy to let him have the key in case he was out and he could sit and wait for him. Your father has a key to this flat? Yes. He treats us like children. He paid Phil's rent and dropped in once a month to see what he was up to. So Daddy gave Uncle the key and that was all. Anyway... I'm going to start packing up Phil's things. Yeah, but before you go, my dear, uh, you said you'd bring your father's manservant with you. Is he... Uh, Henry? Oh, yes, he's waiting in the car. He wasn't sure if you wanted him right away. Shall I go and fetch him? Yes, please. Oh, Rob, you are a dear. And when you get back, you can come and give me a hand with the packing. A few minutes later, we were joined by Henry Marsh, who perched nervously on the edge of a chair. My previous employer, sir? Oh, yes, certainly. I had the honour to work for Lord Sandyville. Really? Until you left under a cloud, I suppose. Oh, no, sir. I only left after his lordship passed away. Ah, another mysterious murder, perhaps? Good gracious, no, sir. You ask Sir William. I'm sure he'd give me a very good reference. Not if he knew what I know. Mr Marsh, your sins have found you out. Oh, steady on, old man. Confess now. You stole Sir William's manuscript. Oh, sir, I, I didn't mean to... I, I, I didn't know what it was. And when I found out, it was too late. Shall I tell you what you did? Sir William had purchased two new hats recently. A Homburg and a Topper. No doubt he tried them on in the shop and ordered them to be sent. But on Saturday night, when you were laying out his evening clothes, you found they'd sent him a top hat that was much too big. But that's right. How did you find out? You knew Sir William had a quick temper. He might blame you for the mistake, so you stuffed the hat band with paper, a flimsy packet of papers you found in his desk. And next day you discovered what you'd done. That little bundle was worth a cool $10,000. So the hat fitted him snugly that night, but when someone shoved it on Driscoll's head, it was much too big, because the papers had gone. Presumably whoever killed Driscoll stole them. Uh, unless, of course... Very well, yes, very well, Mr. Marsh. We won't keep you. I'm sure you'll feel better now you've made your confession. Yes, but when you tell Sir William, he'll be very... I don't think we need bother Sir William about it. He's got enough troubles already. Off you go, Mr. Marsh. I'm sure you'll sleep soundly tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. 
As I was about to say, before I was so rudely interrupted... You were about to say, unless, of course, Philip Driscoll stole the manuscript himself. But, as I keep telling you, Driscoll would never have upset his uncle like that. So you can imagine how he felt when he discovered he'd done the one thing in the world he didn't want to do. I don't follow. I thought the Mad Hatter... Don't, don't you see? Philip Driscoll was the Mad Hatter. He was a struggling freelance, keen to make his name. He needed a front-page scoop, so he decided to create one. A policeman's helmet, a judge's wig, they all made good headlines, and I suspect his next little triumph would have been to steal the headgear of a yeoman warder and nail it to a door with a crossbow bolt to give it a neat historical touch. Do you mean to say that... Yes, he stole that bolt himself, probably during Sunday lunch. This is what I was looking for. The file he used to sharpen the point. And 24 hours later, it killed him. But why did he steal two of Sir William's hats? It would hardly have been front-page news the second time. No, of course not. When he found the manuscript inside the top hat, he was appalled. And when Sir William told us about a thief breaking into his car, it was really Philip trying to return the manuscript. So he created a diversion by snatching the Homburg and running off into the fog. Quick thinking. I'll say one thing for him. He was full of surprises. While our young friends were busy, I took Hadley into the study. There was a heap of burnt paper in the grate. From the fragments we pieced together, it was clear that they were letters from Laura to Philip. That was why she looked so alarmed when General Mason mentioned some fascinating letters on his desk, and why she broke into the flat to destroy them. But underneath those letters, there were some very different fragments. Only a few words in faded sepia ink were legible, but I had no doubt whose hand had written them. Edgar Allan Poe. Another mystery story. will never be solved, alas. Now, that's got to be about Arbor. Hello? Yes, speaking. What? Oh. Right, I'll be there as soon as I can. What's happened? It's all over. I blame myself. I should have realised what a state he was in. Oh, sorry. I thought it might have been for me. I didn't mean to barge in. No, come in. Shut the door. I'm afraid there's some more bad news. Lister Batten? Yes. He went home and put a bullet through his brain. Dear God. Do you want to break it to Miss Batten, or would you like me to do it? 
No, don't bother. I'll tell her. But I'd better not take her back there. She'd be terribly upset. Oh, wait. I know her best friend, a girl who lives in Park Lane. I'll get Margaret to put her up for the night, if that's all right. As we were about to leave the flat, the telephone rang again. Hatley was informed that Mr. Julius Arbour wished to see him as soon as possible. We arranged to meet him at Sir William's house. When we arrived at Bloomsbury Square, Hatley rang the doorbell. I'm not much good at quotations, but there's one that always stays in my mind. There's no refuge from confession but suicide. And suicide is confession. A well-turned phrase, but not invariably true. Ah, somebody's coming. Ah, so we meet again, Mr. Marsh. Yes, sir. Please come in, gentlemen. In this situation, sir, perhaps I should have called a doctor. But since Mr. Batten was dead... No, you did the right thing. I take it you informed Sir William. Well, sir, he was still very upset after what happened this morning. He'd taken a sleeping draught, and I didn't like to awaken him. I thought it might be better to let him sleep. I see. Uh, well, when you heard the shot, you went up to Mr. Batten's room? Oh, yes, sir. I found him, as you'll see, lying on his bed, fully dressed. Where was Mrs. Batten? In the next room. Uh, there's a communicating door. She came in a moment later. All right. Let's go upstairs. Lester Batten was still holding the Webley Scott service automatic in his right hand, but his face was curiously peaceful. I left Hadley to do what had to be done and knocked on the communicating door. Come in, Dr. Fell. You know all about it, don't you? About Phil and me. I knew you'd find out. You shouldn't have broken into his flat. You were seen. I didn't break in. Phil had given me a key. But I took a chisel from his tool bag and broke the lock to make it look like a burglary. Oh, never mind. It doesn't matter now. No. Did you see what Lester had in his hand? The gun? No, the other hand. It was a snapshot. A photo of me. When I saw that, I, I stood there for a long time looking at him. And now, sitting by this window, looking into the darkness, oh, I can see a thousand images, and they're all his. I cried today when Phil died, but I can't cry any more, because I know now I loved my husband. Just tell me, he killed Philip, didn't he? Mrs. Batten, your husband loved you very much. Hold on to that thought. It was only... His ideas were so different from mine, and I kept hurting him. If I sleep tonight, perhaps... Perhaps tomorrow I'll be able to cry. I went down to the library, where Mr. Arbour was waiting. I was about to explain that the superintendent was otherwise engaged, but I didn't get the chance... Superintendent Hadley, am I glad to see you? Uh, yeah, quite, yes. G good evening, Mr. Arbour. I decided I I've got to tell you the whole truth. Yes, I think that might be a very wise move. Yeah, well, well, just tell me, is Sir William around? He's gone to bed, having an early night. Uh, did you tell him uh, about my purchasing the rights to the manuscript legally? Uh, no, I didn't. Well, there wasn't much point, since the manuscript no longer exists. It's just a pile of ashes. Well, yeah, look, I've... Brought you one little scrap as a souvenir. What? This is an outrage. This is my... This was my property. If I were you, I'd put that piece of paper away and say no more about it. You're in enough trouble as it is. What do you mean by that? Uh, let's be frank. You wanted to get hold of that manuscript by fair means or foul. But you were afraid of Sir William. So you offered someone money to steal it on your behalf. That is not true. I admit the idea did cross my mind, but that's as far as it went, until last Sunday night when I received a phone call from an unknown person. He wouldn't give his name, but even though I'd only met him once, I knew right away it was Philip Driscoll. He asked me how much I'd pay if he got hold of the manuscript and handed it over, no questions asked. So I named a rather large sum, and he agreed. 
And what happened next? And what happened next was he got killed. Well, I was in a quandary. I guessed he must have been murdered on account of stealing the manuscript, and I thought maybe I'd be involved as some kind of accessory. But there was worse to come. When you left us this afternoon, you had a terrible fright and dashed back to Golders Green in a blind panic. Why was that? Oh, when I left, I, I heard a voice speaking inside the tower, and it was the same voice. It was Driscoll's voice. But you just told me he was dead, and somehow... He'd return to haunt me. You're laughing at me. I'm not laughing, merely smiling. If that's all that's worrying you, let me assure you, you have no need to fear. The voice can't hurt you now. But if I were you, I'd return to America as soon as possible, before you landed any more trouble. And then you packed him off with a flea in his ear. Good work, Chief Superintendent. And the pleasure was all mine, believe me. And meanwhile, have you come to any conclusions? Yes and no. Lester killed Driscoll. No one else had the means and the motive. He went to the tower where he witnessed Philip and Laura's last rendezvous. And when Philip left, he followed and... Excuse me. May I speak to you for a moment? Yeah, no, go away. Don't say anything. I'm sorry. I really no, must... Oh, don't back us up. Keep your mouth shut for heaven's sake. It's no good. I'm here to give myself up, Superintendent. I killed Philip Driscoll. Uh, what? But I didn't that... mean to. It was an accident. I wasn't going to say anything, only you suspected Lester Batten. And then he killed himself, so I had to tell you the truth. You young idiot. I've been trying to cover up for you all the evening. Now, just a moment. Are you telling me you actually killed... Not on purpose. He jumped at me, and in the fight... God knows I didn't want to hurt him. I only wanted... I only wanted to steal that damn manuscript. Uh, wait, right there. Would you mind telling me how you managed to be in the flat in Hoban at half past one and kill Driscoll at the tower a few minutes later? Uh, no, no, no. That's where we went wrong. Driscoll wasn't killed at the tower. He died in his own flat. But that's impossible. No, it's true. Why Phil came back to the flat, I still don't know. I was certain he'd be at the tower. He told me he'd hidden the manuscript in his flat. That's why I thought it would be safe to steal it. You mean you knew he was the man?
at that, of course. He always asked me to help him. We'd even discussed his next trick. He was going to snaffle a hat from one of the yeoman warders. <coughs> yes, well, never mind that. You also knew about the manuscript. I told him to hang on to it, because I had a plan of my own. On Sunday night, I phoned Arbor and asked him how much he'd pay me if I stole the manuscript for him. I know it was rotten of me, but I was pretty desperate. But Arbor said it was Driscoll who phoned him. Yet yeah, You overlooked something that Sheila Batten told us. She said Driscoll sometimes played jokes on her, ringing up and pretending to be Dullery. Their voices must have been very similar. Which is why I was able to ring Parker, pretending I was Philip. The mysterious second phone call. Yeah. Remember? You'd called the other line on your phone and spoken to Parker, telling him that you were Driscoll and asking to speak to yourself, as you told him. You just hung up when he walked in. It was an ingenious plan, and at first it all went like clockwork. You see, I had to have money. Real money. <clears throat> Sheila and I want to get married, but Sir William's a very wealthy man, and I'm only a jumped-up clerk with no prospects. I knew he'd never accept me as a son-in-law unless I had cash in the bank. I realise now it was a crazy idea, but at the time... Well, like I said, I was desperate. I only had to leave the general's car at the Hoban garage, nip across to the flat and get the manuscript. It took me quite a while to find it. And while I was searching, the phone rang and I picked it up automatically. It was silly of me. But actually, it gave me an alibi. It was Parker saying that Phil was at the tower. So I knew I had all the time in the world. Eventually, I ran the damn thing to earth. In the wardrobe, inside the pocket of one of his suits. And then... And then... I had it in my hands. Suddenly I heard a sound. I turned round and Phil was standing in the doorway, looking at me. He realised what I was going to do, and he... he went berserk. You never saw him in one of his rages. He was like a maniac. The crossbow bolt was on the table, and he snatched it up and charged at me. I tried to dodge, but I don't know how it happened. A chair overturned. We hit the floor together, and I was on top of him. There was a sort of dull crunch. And then... Go on. I heard the sound of his breath, hissing and gurgling out of him, as the point of the bolt was driven into his chest, and then nothing. I knew he was dead. I never meant it to happen. I still don't know why he came back. Perhaps I can tell you. A little earlier, when Philip was talking to Laura at the traitor's gate, he remembered something. He suddenly remembered his uncle's monthly visit to inspect Tavistock Court. The old boy would arrive at the flat, let himself in, and no doubt he'd find his stolen headgear. If he searched long enough, he might even have found the manuscript. Philip had to get back there as fast as possible to head him off. He told Laura to wait for him. It, you know, you can get from the tower to Hoburn on the underground in 15 minutes, sometimes less. But the body was found at the traitor's gate. Would you mind explaining that, Mr. Dowry? First, I was too paralysed with fear to think straight. I killed him. Nobody would believe it was an accident. My only hope was to take his body and dump it somewhere else. And I still had to collect the general's car. So I dashed round to the garage and picked it up, drove to the yard at the back of the flats, which isn't overlooked, carried Phil out and put him in the back seat, under a rug. I took Sir William's top hat as well. I thought if I put it on his head, everyone would assume the Mad Hatter had killed him. And the manuscript? Do you imagine, after what had happened, I still wanted to make blood money out of it? Before I left the flat, I chucked it into the grate and put a match to it. By a strange coincidence, a little later, someone else followed your example. Yet, yeah, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, I jumped into the car and drove off. And at the next crossroads, the lights changed to red and I had to break. And what do you think happened then? Well, as far as I remember, you met your employer. General! Well, this is a godsend. What a stroke of luck. I've been standing on that corner for ten minutes waiting for a cab. Ah, you can drive me back to the tower. It was like a nightmare. I tried to think. It was only ten past two. If I could dump Phil's body somewhere without being seen, I'd have a perfect alibi. When we got there, I had to pull up at the bloody tower to let the general out. When he'd gone, I opened the back door, whipped off the rug and hauled the body out. Then I tipped over the rail and down the steps. It was still very foggy and there was no one in sight. After that, I parked the car and went indoors. And... 
Well, you know the rest. Yes. Uh, Mr. Dowry, will you do something for me? Of course. I want you to go into the hall and sit and wait for a few minutes. Uh, don't speak to anyone until I ask you to come back in, all right? But... Please, don't argue. Just do as you're told. Very well. Go ahead. Send for your Black Mariah, or whatever it's called. I'll wait. Now what? I think I must be getting old. I'm sworn to uphold the law. And yet, no jury would ever believe that boy's testimony. But I do. Yes, so do I. I'd say this case could remain unsolved. What do you think, Hadley? You know what I think. Are we agreed? Let me have those notes you've been scribbling. I'll look after them. Better still... Let me throw them into the fire. There you are. Case unsolved. Case unsolved. In The Mad Hatter Mystery by John Dixon Carr, Dr. Gideon Fell was played by Donald Sindon. Chief Superintendent Hadley, John Hartley. Sir William Batten, Edward Dewsbury, General Mason, Peter Howell, Robert Dalry, Roger Moss, Julius Arbour, Roger Hammond, Yeoman Warder Parker, John Baddeley, Henry Marsh, Anthony Jackson, Laura Batten, Sabina Franklin, Lester Batten, Don McCorkindale, Sheila Batten, Prianga Elan. The Mad Hatter Mystery was dramatised for radio by Peter Ling and directed by Enid Williams.